When I was younger, if someone told me that something was sick, wicked, or dope, I would have thought that they were referring to something very nasty indeed. If it was sick, then it was something very distasteful. If it was wicked, it was certainly something evil. And if it was dope, then for me, it either had something to do with drugs or was something rather dull or stupid. But as time has gone by, these words have come to mean for many people, something completely different than what you might expect, sometimes even quite the opposite to what you might expect. For many of the younger generation, to say that something is sick means that it's really cool and awesome, very impressive. The same goes for the word wicked, which apparently means that it's really wonderful. If something is dope, then it too is something really good, enjoyable, and impressive. Gone are the days, it seems, when words had meanings that were obvious and permanent. With this in mind, we might be more inclined to have sympathy with poor Peter as he puts his foot in it once again in this Sunday's Gospel by remonstrating with Jesus about the Christ having to undergo suffering. Peter has just declared under the influence of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Christ. When this scene is recounted in other Gospels, Jesus praises Peter's declaration that he is the Christ and tells us that it was God the Father who revealed that to him, stirred that awareness in him. By declaring Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah, Peter probably thought that he was on solid ground when he tells Jesus, heaven forbid that any such thing as suffering should happen to you, the Christ. With 2,000 years behind us, we are very used to the idea of a suffering Christ. Jesus Christ, we know, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried, as we state in the Creed. But that we know all that. We do so with hindsight. Peter didn't have the benefit of hindsight yet. He had the faith understanding of the average Jew for whom the Christ was a figure of immense godly power, impressive military might, and who would go from victory to victory establishing God's full reign over Israel and then the whole world. Rejection by the Jewish elders, suffering and death at the hands of pagans, that was definitely not part of the Jewish definition of the Messiah. Peter's expectation of the kind of king, the, the kind of Messiah Jesus was supposed to be, is formed by everything he has learnt as he grew up. The words Christ and suffering are not really to be found in the same sentence in Peter's worldview. But as with many things Jesus teaches, he has a higher understanding of what his mission as the Christ will entail. And his understanding of the prophets who alluded to a suffering Christ will later form Peter's understanding and the church's understanding of who Jesus is and how he wins the victory of the kingdom of God. Jesus fulfills and at the same time far surpasses all the expectations of the Jewish people. And what about us? What about our expectations? What are our expectations of who Jesus is and how things should be for those of us who follow him? Following Christ, to have faith in him, brings immense blessings and eventual eternal blessings upon us. But Jesus warns that following him will also entail some form of suffering, some touch of the cross, or what I like to call splinters from the cross. That's unavoidable. We must be careful that we don't buy into what could be called a sort of prosperity gospel, believing that if we have strong enough faith, then we will never have a day's bother, 
that having Jesus in my life, well, that will mean that it's all plain sailing. Glory, 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 until I float off into heavenly glory. Experience tells us otherwise. Can we find any saint in the history of the church who did not have to endure much tribulation and many trials as they sought to be faithful to the Lord? Indeed, perhaps we know people ourselves, good, holy, faithful followers of Jesus, who have suffered greatly. Physical sicknesses, the misunderstanding and even malice of friends and family, imprisonment and persecution, hunger and deprivation, often made its presence felt in the lives of some of our greatest saints. And it wasn't because of lack of faith, that they experienced these things, but because in faith they had drawn ever closer to Christ and were identifying with him. If we have swallowed some of the ideas of a prosperity gospel, then when suffering comes upon us, we might be tempted to think, "Mm, I must not have enough faith, or worse still, We might cruelly say to someone who is struggling, Poor you, if only you had a little more faith in Jesus, you wouldn't have to undergo this suffering. Can you imagine saying that to St. Therese as she's coming to the end of her 18 months endurance of slowly dying of TB? Oh, Sister Therese, if only you had stronger faith, you wouldn't be dying at 24 of this terrible disease. Or would we say it to the Christian martyrs of the past, or even those of the past few years? Would we say to them, you're under persecution. If only you had a bit more faith, you wouldn't have to undergo all this trial. When the truth is, it's precisely because they are so strong in their faith commitment to Christ. It's precisely because they are followers of Christ that they are being persecuted in the first place. Jesus tells us very clearly in today's gospel that following him will necessarily bring us into contact with the unpleasantness of living in this fallen and so broken world. We will have to put our shoulder to the cross in some way or other. Whether we have great faith or no faith at all, life can and will deal us hard blows. Crosses will come our way. We don't have to go looking for them. And it's not a lack of faith to find those crosses, both the big ones and the small, unpleasant and hard to bear. And indeed, our natural reaction is to shrink back from them and ask the Lord, if it were possible, could we have it some other way? Faith, however, is not a natural reaction. It's a supernatural reaction. And so faith, confronted with a trial, turns a cross into the cross, into a participation with Christ and his cross, into a union with Christ crucified. And that makes all the difference. If anyone wants to be a follower of mine, says Jesus, let him renounce himself and take up his cross and follow me. Elsewhere, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, In the world you will have trouble, but have courage. I have overcome the world. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we follow a crucified Christ. And we must never forget that.